why do we age through our reproductive window? So why, why is it our cells cannot maintain the same youthful function all the way up until the end of our reproductive window? Essentially, why is it why are we well, seeing they, the aging through you're, that process? What you're you're talking about is, you know, why can't we age better? And, you know, we we can age as well as we can age, you know. So um, I don't know, I'm I'm 61. What I do is I try to stay active, right? I don't think that there's no tech um, you know, that is available to me. There's no, you know, young blood infusions. You know, there's no evidence basis for that. I guess what there's, I'm getting at, though, is what's happening in the cell. Intrinsically. Intrinsically, that would explain that, that age. It's loss of repair capacity, largely. You know, I, I don't know that anyone can fully answer that question. That's actually a really hard question. But um, we have a gene set that puts us together, right? And we reach our maximal, you know, size by around 20, right? And, um, and you know, the, 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 pr the problem is that it's, it's from an evolutionary point of view, as I say, I'm gonna use the, the, the term that someone thre threw at me on Twitter of hotness, right? The um, Evolution is is basically if you look at at birds, right? You know, bird bird watching is a is a very enjoyable thing, where you have have males that have remarkable plumage, and you have females that um, evaluate that, and they're they're talking back and forth to each other in in very interesting ways, and um, all of that is a very complicated um, set of um, selective processes in male and female brains that is evaluating the other, the, the, part, the potential partner's reproductive capacity, gene set, ability to provide, et cetera, et cetera. And those things operate throughout the animal kingdom. And um, it seems to me that um, because we, here, here's one way that, 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 that I've explained it, um, here, here in, in North America, we, America, we have foxes, right? Usually the foxes are born in the spring and they can reproduce by the time they're about, you know, six or nine months old, right? So a male, you know, less than one year old male and female fox are, are pretty foxy, right? They, they, are, they are capable. They're long out of mom's care. They're capable of getting their own food. They can, they can identify the opposite sex and they can reproduce, right? And they're going to, if they reproduce at the age of eight months, they're going to pass on a gene set. Now, if they're clever enough and capable enough to go through um, five or six winters, then they will be able to reproduce five or six times. And so they will contribute five or six times more genetic information into the Fox gene pool. But the fact of the matter is, if they don't have very good longevity, and they simply are able to reach their reproductive capacity, they will be able to contribute their genes to the gene pool. So their longevity is not a directly selected trait. Their vision is a selected trait. Their sense of smell is a selected trait. Their size is a selected trait. Their coat color is a selected trait. Their, um, their brains and their ability to know where the owls are from hearing is a selected trait. So dumb foxes, you know, get eaten by a bigger animal the first time they leave mom, right? So there aren't a lot of really dumb foxes that can reproduce. There's not a lot of blind foxes that can reproduce. 
There's not a lot of foxes that don't have a sense of smell that can reproduce. But a fox that can't live three or four years can still reproduce one or two or maybe three times. So what you're saying here and you're sort of underscoring is that evolution is selecting for genes based on what can help us survive, reproduce, and then care for our young. And after that, our genes really don't so, care so about especially us. Especially survive, survive the period, the per time between our birth and getting to reproductive uh, maturation. And, so and then once we're at, at reproductive maturation, we're in our prime. And then all animals have some type of decline. Some animals are really, really good agers like naked mole rats and humans that can maintain for, 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 for a while, but a lot of animals aren't. Hey friends, the scientific evidence on lifestyle habits that lead to longevity is clear. Now it's time to put this knowledge into action. I'm excited to announce the Living Proof Longevity Challenge, a 12-week program to build evidence-based lifestyle habits to optimize longevity. My team and I have transformed over hundreds of hours of conversations with experts on aging, nutrition, and exercise into a life-changing 12-week program that will challenge you to develop habits that lead to a longer, better life. This is a unique opportunity to gather health data about yourself that has the potential to change your life for the better. You'll start by testing 10 longevity biomarkers that tell the truth about where your longevity stands right now, today. Following that, you'll get a personalized longevity score to guide your 12 weeks of habit building that will boost your score and improve your biomarkers for the better. After the challenge, you'll retest your 10 biomarkers and see the proof of how powerful these science-backed habits really are. Head over to theproof.com forward slash living proof to download your zero cost copy of the Living Proof Longevity Challenge today. That's theproof.com forward slash living proof. Look forward to joining you on this journey. What are the implications of, of this? What you're saying, there's no um, selection for longevity. There's no monogenic you know, longevity genes. This is polygenic. Uh, what are the implications with regards to targeting longevity when you start to think about it through this lens? It's a hard problem. Um, I, we know that um, you. We know that. First of all, we know that age is a risk factor for all sorts of diseases, most diseases, right? Um, but that doesn't make aging a disease, right? Aging, from my point of view, is a fact of life. We know that you can age better or worse and that it's very easy to age worse, right? So um, people that smoke, overeat, are sedentary, drink a lot of alcohol, um, engage in violent or dangerous activities, have occupational hazards, um, live shorter lives, right? Um, can you extend lifespan? I don't know that you can extend lifespan beyond a genetically encoded maximum, but you can tr you can try to age better. What's the genetically encoded maxim maximum? We think it's humans? 120. We think it's 120 years. Um, there's not really very good examples of any documented people to live beyond 122. So it, it looks like that's potentially the maximum. Do you think that perspective of what you've just shared there gets less airtime because it's a little less sexy and it's, I guess, could be perceived as a bit more cynical than the other kind of um, narrative being that we could extend lifespan, lifespan by a considerable amount? Well, you know, I, I'm all for healthy aging and um, more people living into their 90s and 100 and, and, and a little beyond that with vigor. So that I think that's a that's a good goal, um, but um, yeah, I don't see any tech on the horizon that would 
really extend beyond uh, genetically encoded uh, longevity uh, maxima. Um, you know, even caloric restriction is actually more problematic than people think it is because in the experimental environment, the control group is ad libitum fed, so basically overfed. So, you know, in, the, in, in nature, um, mice would be scurrying around all night collecting enough calories for them to live 24 hours, right? In a cage, they're provided with a big pile of food every day, and they never run out of food. And so, the ad libitum, the ad lib fed control mice um, are actually gaining weight and probably have a shortened lifespan with respect to, you know, uh, calorie restricted. Calorie res restricted is more like a normal mouse, right? So, th so the the way the results are reported, they will say caloric restriction, extended lifespan of, of these mice. Relative. But I would, yeah, but I would say, yeah, compared to the control group, I would say the control group of ad libitum fed mice and virtually all of the data that we have on mice had a shortened lifespan because we kept them confined in the cage and we fed them every day. Now, you can, you know, you can say, well, okay, but that's a good model for you know, human that, you know, we're uh, ad libitum fed essentially, and we're less active than we used to be a, a thousand years ago. That's also true. But, um, you know, I don't see any um, drugs uh, that are being considered for lifespan extension as probable lifespan extension drugs. I see metformin as a drug for people with type 2 diabetes um, with evidence that it would probably um, blunt the beneficial effects of exercise. Rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor. Um, mTOR is a regulator of skeletal muscle function and um, you know maintenance of our skeletal muscle is one of the most important things as we age because our skeletal muscle disposes of glucose and it keeps us uh, together so that we don't fall, you know, in, in, as we age, I would, I would be more likely to take a leucine analog to support my mTOR signaling than rapamycin or a rapamycin analog to inhibit my mTOR signaling. I'm not signing up for any rapamycin tests. That's interesting because it's rapamycin is, I guess, one of the front runners in the, the kind of longevity conversation right now. Right. So again, in, in, in mouse models, you see that extends lifespan. It may be extending frailty, uh, however, um, especially in, in the human context. So it comes back to that trade-off. Right. Right.